It's Conduit News Radio with Paul Harrell. Welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks so much for being with us. Good morning to you. Happy Monday. Thanks for starting the beginning of your week with us here. It's the intersection of conservative ideas and reality. My name is Paul, and uh, we are building a liberty machine, uh, and it's one that stands in defiance of the Marble Palace establishment here in Arkansas. If you want to help us do that, one of the ways you can contribute is just a call or text. Let us know what's going on, 870-275-9799. You can also sound off over at facebook.com slash conduit news. That's facebook.com slash conduit news. We have a lot to get to. Uh, at the top of the next hour, we're going to be talking with State Representative Brant Smith. will be stopping by. Uh, he'll be here in studio. Then at the bottom of the next hour, we'll be talking with the uh, co-founders of Conduit. Mr. Joe Maynard and Brenda Vassar-Taylor will be on the program. So last week, uh, I was uh, very confused last week uh, by some of the statements that Governor Asa Hutchinson made uh, concerning uh, this program, what he referred to as a machine, a media machine, uh, and I, I was just, I, I didn't understand why he did it. I didn't understand when he did it, the day that he did it. Something just didn't seem right. Something seemed a little bit, um, a little too off the cuff outside of his carefully crafted language. I will say this, though, uh, what, when the governor came out and criticized Conduit, he certainly got the mainstream media to latch on to what he was saying. There were several articles. There was a Talk Business article. There was a Michael Wickline article in the Gazette. There was a John Brummett editorial on what the governor said. And lastly, uh, the last article was this Northwest Arkansas editorial from the Northwest Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Now, granted, this is uh, an article on what the governor said to the Political Animals Club about conduit and about uh, this, this concept, this phony concept of one person... Uh, project or one person trying to control the legislature, which is, uh, if if that person exists, is Governor Asa Hutchinson himself. Okay, so it'll be very clear there, and I am going to prove it to you this hour. Are you ready? Not in my words, but in the words of legislators. But before we do that, why did Governor last week start to attack uh, this program? Why did he say that Conduit News is not real news? Why did he say those things? First off, let's look at this article. Northwest Arkansas editorial, Fighting the Fringes, Hutchinson Issues Warning About Political Groups. I mean, this is as, the most, this is as hypocritical as you can possibly get. But how do they start the article? How do they start the article when attacking Conduit? Listen to what they say. Back in the days when Asa Hutchinson was the youngest U.S. attorney in the nation, appointed by a gentleman named Ronald Reagan, there was a little group of terrorist thugs operating in Arkansas known as the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. The group was building up quite a stockpile of arms, and extremist views ran in the same circles as the Ku Klux Klan and the Aryan Nation and harbored men wanted in connection with murder. Are you kidding me? This is how they start... Because, of course, Asa Hutchinson calls Conduit an extreme group, right? An extreme right-wing group. Uh, really? I mean, I think people who have honest disagreements with lower taxes and less regulations would find the beginning of this article just a little much. Uh, and again, it's just very strange. Now... Uh, it goes on. Their activities drew the attention of law enforcement, leading to a four-day standoff at a compound near the Arkansas-Missouri line. Hutchinson, who would go on to prosecute some of the group's members, put on a bullet-resistant vest and walked into the compound to negotiate its bloodless end. Now, I want you to know something, because I read social media and I know what Asa Hutchinson fanboys out there say. And this is what they're saying. They're trying to promote the idea. Remember when Asa Hutchinson put on a bulletproof vest and walked in there? This whole article was written, uh, I mean, you know, it was basically the ideas came directly from the reelect Asa Hutchinson campaign. Directly from there. Because if you read it, it's all stuff that you can find Asa Hutchinson fanboys out there saying, okay, uh, on social media and so forth. But um, 
I was wondering, why why is it, why was it that Asa Hutchinson did what he did last week? Why did he finally go out and attack? Because i got to be honest, we've had, I mean, our, our as far as our, our views and things like that, we've actually had more people interested in the uh, information disseminated on this program. Um, and I will tell you what it is. I, it dawned on me this weekend when I was reading the headlines this weekend. Um, I have been speaking out. Uh, against the corruption in Arkansas for a very long time, talking about the FBI investigations. We've had sources tell us about indictments coming. Indictments have come. We've heard that there are more indictments on the way. We've heard that it is a there's a, such a culture of corruption in Arkansas. Max Brantley now reporting as many as 20 legislators. Back in October, my source was saying it was anywhere from 15 to 17. So I think we're pretty much lining up. We have legislators now, and uh, they're now coming out, former legislators coming out saying, they took hundred thousand dollars in bribes and that's when it hit me that's when it hit me folks if you're at the top of the heap whether it leads to you or not and you're just a part of the status quo if the the level of arkansas corruption that i believe is at is about to be unveiled to everybody and and this program is pretty much the only voice who has been out there day in and day out demanding that Jake Files resign for a second, or, or for, for instance, when, when Asa Hutchinson wouldn't, when the Republican Party of Arkansas wouldn't. We've been telling you about the corruption in Medicaid and a $2 billion program for a long time. And if all of a sudden we're the lone voice and all of a sudden everything we've been predicting and everything, all of the uh, corruption surrounding this turns out to be revealed to everybody, guess who starts to look pretty bad? The people in power. The people who've been protecting the status quo, the people who've been saying there's nothing to see here. And I think it all started when Rusty Cranford was in the paper last week accused of trying to hire a guy to kill that New Jersey lobbyist. I think that's when it all started. And then it all kind of a nice little bow on the week when we have this headline. Former Arkansas legislator's name surfaces in graft case. Joe, uh, Joe go to this article. Henry Hank Williams IV, county judge of Jefferson County, took $100,000 in bribes from indicted lobbyist Milton Russell Rusty Cranford while serving in the Arkansas legislature, an assistant U.S. attorney said Friday. The money purportedly was given in the form of donations to a Pine Bluff church where Wilkins is pastor. And they should say, they should put a uh, pastor there in quotes, by the way. They should say where he is, quote, pastor, end quote. Um, so the guy basically used the church as a way to conceal a hundred thousand dollar bribe. Assistant U.S. Attorney Stephen uh, Molenrick made the statements during Transfer's arraignment on corruption charges Friday in Missouri. Why is it Missouri that's involved in all this? Why why aren't we? Why why is it Missouri prosecuting all of this? What where's Arkansas prosecutors? Hmm. This is all coming out of Missouri. This is all coming out of another state. Wonder why our prosecutors aren't doing anything about this. Wilkins, a longtime state and county elected official and church pastor, has not been charged with any crime, according to available federal court records. He did not respond Friday afternoon to several telephone and email messages from the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Wilkins made the bribery admission in a February 22nd statement to the FBI, according to government attorneys. That was the day after Cranford's arrest on corruption tri uh, charges in an alleged scheme in which executives for a Springfield, Missouri-based behavioral health uh, healthcare provider paid bribes through Cranford's lobbying firms to obtain state grants and other taxpayer money. Ouch. It's all coming out, folks. Every bit of this is coming out. Now, they're saying, now if you f f uh, flip on over to Max Brantley, okay, uh, let me see this article here. Max Brantley writes, bombshell of a story this morning from Doug Thompson. He has more on this. Uh, keep going down here, uh, Joe, until I find what I'm looking for here. Um, because eventually it talks about how... Uh, I mean, it, okay, so stop here. It's not just Cranford's first link to the illicit behavior of legislators. He's mentioned but not charged in the scheme alleging kickbacks from state surplus accounts known as GIF that produced a guilty plea from Micah Neal, Senator John Woods, and former Democratic Representative Eddie Cooper, who went to work for Preferred Family Health. Okay, keep going down. The correct, I mean, this, this, I don't know how far this is going to go. I really don't. Um, eventually, we find, okay, yeah, keep going, keep going. 
Uh, Max Brentley writes, I've been told for weeks there was more to come. Last week, a lawyer with knowledge of Wilkins, okay, this former state rep county judge in Jefferson County, Last week, a lawyer with knowledge of Wilkins' involvement with Cranford predicted disclosure soon. He said there were reports of numerous legislators who'd made proffers, a sworn or sworn accounts of what they'd be willing to say in court to federal investigators. He said as many as 20 legislators could be involved. Again, Max Brantley of the Arkansas Times. Okay, folks, so what do we have to see here? What do we have to see? You may choose to believe it's just a coincidence that the week when all of this is starting to really gain steam, uh, Asa decides to come out and attack this program and call us a media machine. Of course, I mean, you know, I've never been on uh, MSNBC or, or CNN. He gets to go on there anytime he wants. So, I mean, you know, you be the judge who the media machine is, who really has the bully pulpit. I mean, I'm just a talk radio host. I'm just trying to get people the truth. And I think when they hear it, they realize what it is, and they realize they've been sold a pack of lies. But, hey, you know, if, if I, it is what it is. Um, I don't believe it's a coincidence that all this stuff starts to come out uh, the week he decides to get involved and start to try to push back against this uh, because we have been the lone voice uh, pushing out uh, the corruption, pushing back against the corruption, and uh, – Nobody else has seemed to want to do that. Um, I mean, there there have been a few legislators. Brian King would be one. Uh, uh, Josh Miller would be another. And, 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 and there are others, but you know what I mean, who have actively been saying, look, there's a lot of money involved here, and uh, there's a lot of corruption going on behind the scenes. And now we have legislators apparently willing to testify in federal court of what they know. This is a, this is a really, really big deal. And uh, it's only going to get worse. We're going to find out more. And I just have a feeling that the Marble Palace political establishment status quo is going to be, public opinion is going to be like, eh, we don't think this is good and more and more people are going to know. And you know what? It could have been as simple as Governor Hutchinson learning, whoops, all of this is about to come out and it's going to come out before the primary in May, not after the primary in May. John Woods goes to trial in April. So maybe there's just a little bit of nervousness from the Marble Palace establishment and those who attend its court. We are going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to highlight this concept, this accusation of control. And I'm going to show you this hour who really controls the Marble Palace. And it's not its not the people. It is uh, the people who want something from government. And then, you know, the, 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 the disdain that is out there for people who try to participate in the electoral process but don't want anything back from government. They just want the people who want things from government and use force against the people to not have access to be able to do that anymore, then all of a sudden, the people who want the liberty and the freedom are the enemies. Very, very interesting. Huge displays of hypocrisy right now from the Marble Palace elite, and we'll continue to expose it. This is Conduit News Radio. I'm Paul Harrell. Back in a moment. All right, so the Northwest Arkansas Democrat Gazette editorial we were just going over uh, that gets this close uh, from directly comparing the dissenting voices of liberty and freedom today with neo-Nazis and Ku Klux Klan members, um, if it doesn't really actually do that. They write, uh, Hutchins, they, they quote Hutchinson's, uh, Governor Hutchinson's uh, quotes from last week. Quote, right now, our state has a special interest group in northwest Arkansas that is controlled by one person who is using various conduits, including a media arm, to pump tens of thousands of dollars in order to control legislators. This is not good for our state or the body politic. Their goal is to push a narrow an agenda of isolating our state, limiting its growth, and shutting down government. So you can expect me to be engaged in that political fight as needed because we don't need our legislators controlled by anyone except for the people of their district. Hutchinson told last week, uh, last week's luncheon attendees, this is the most hypocritical statement probably of the year so far. Maybe there's more to come. So I decided to do a little bit of a flashback for you guys to illustrate who really controls 
uh, who, who really is representing their people. The ones who try to represent their district are ostracized and uh, are threatened. That is that is the truth of the matter by the Marble Palace. If it's not Hutchinson's way, it's nobody's way. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the truth. And to think anything otherwise would be extremely naive. This is what uh, I did last year after the session last year ended about April or so. I sat down with as many legislators as I could, and I asked them their impression of the session from 2017. And many of them had very bad things to say, and eventually they get to the governor. Uh, some get to the governor about how they weren't allowed to run certain bills. Uh, listen, we're not going to be able to listen to all of it, but I've got some highlights for you. We're going to start at the top. Here was Senator Gary Stubblefield when we did this impression of the session, and then we put it together in a montage. Listen to this. It's one of those sessions where I think there was a lot of pressure. It seemed like it was unusual. Uh, I've been through four of these now, and this one was a lot different because it seemed like early on there was a lot of pressure building up among the different members in the Senate and the House then. And some strange things happened. I, I don't, why I don't know. You know, I know they voted on the other end to allow the, the speaker to have the discretion to choose all the committee members and uh, basically gave away their tenure and that was kind of a shock. Have State Representative Kim Hendren. And so this last session, there was a rule change brought by the, by the speaker that he appoints all committees, all chairmen and all vice chairmen. And uh, I don't agree with that. I think that's wrong. I have told the speaker that personally. What's happened is it's all consolidated. And I just say this, Paul, and your listeners need to understand. I hope they'll understand this. We've got 135 members in that legislature down there. Nobody, no member down there ought to get two bites at the apple before the, the one with the least seniority, the last one in there, gets the first bite. And that's what's going on over and over and over again. And it ought to be stopped. And the only people that can stop it are the voters of the state of Arkansas, and they will stop it if they know what's going on. I don't go around saying, I'm going to look at your skill set, decide what you need to do, and then put you in a committee. Because when that kind of stuff happens, there's, there's the, there's the I, you owe somebody. And that's the problem that's going on down there right now. More and more power is getting concentrated in fewer and fewer people. State Representative Brand Smith from District 58. Take as long or be as brief as you want. Just in general, what is your impression of the session 2017? Well, overall, I think it was fairly successful. And I use the term fairly because there were bills that were brought before the House that uh, were divisive. Uh, caused a lot more anxiety than perhaps we wanted. A total of $380 million in proposed or passed taxes. Uh, that makes uh, limited government conservatives that want to keep their money a little nervous. What are your thoughts on that, Senator Johnson? They didn't make it through. So there was a total of about 17 million that made it through. It don't matter what's proposed. There's a lot of stuff proposed. Uh, 2,000 bills were proposed. You know, some of them were for revenue and some of them were for law changes. But uh, the ones that matter are the ones that passes through the system. It's a, it's a, it's a complex system. There's a lot of uh, physically conservative conserv uh, that that voted against those measures and. and and they didn't make it through. But I mean, what was your impression of this past session? Well, the, the, you know, it's nobody but us and your listeners here, so I'm going to be honest with you. I, this, this session was pretty much a joke. Um, we we lowered, uh, lowered income taxes on our tax bracket of folks that don't pay income taxes usually. And what they do pay, they, they make money on when they get their taxes back. Um, and then... You know, we we continue to uh, fight for and, and uh, uphold Obamacare in Arkansas. We continue to uh, not fully fund programs for the truly needy. And uh, on top of that, we managed to raise a few fees and taxes. I mean, exactly what you would hope for out of a Republican stronghold uh, legislature and governor. Yeah. So I'm picking, that, that's my opinion. On that last just, statement, just, you know, uh, you know that last statement. I'm picking up your sarcasm. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so let me let me 
completely clarify. I am being 100% sarcastic. Uh, it, it was pathetic. It was just pathetic. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, the taxpayers have every right to be aggravated and ashamed. State Representative Jack Ladyman, he's from District 59. It was tough. It was a really tough session. We discussed, <laughs> passed, and failed uh, some very important issues, I thought. Josh Miller's bill to put a cap on the Medicaid expansion. He had a bill. I was on the health committee, and uh, we debated that quite a bit in the health committee, and it passed out of the committee, passed on the floor. Uh, I talked in favor of that on the floor and in the committee. Uh, I thought it was a good move, even though we don't know what Washington's going to do. Uh, that is something that we can do in Arkansas to limit where this thing's going, and, and, and I believe right now it's up, 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 up. the finances are going to get out of control. With 76 Republicans in the House, were your expectations met? No. No, we didn't do what I thought we could do. There were a lot of things that I thought we could pass that did not pass. Um, the, the biggest thing that bothered me, again, was the number of bills that proposed tax increases. I uh, didn't expect that. Um, I, I thought that we would at least cap the Medicaid expansion. Marcus Richmond with us from District 21. Well, I think that there were some things that we did, and we did it well. But at the same time, I think there was uh, room for improvement. Now, we need to be, I believe, just a little more imaginative than constantly trying to figure out some way to increase some tax support. And then dealing with, you know, the internet sales and those type of things, uh, you know, it, you can say what you want, you know, tell everybody that it's not a new tax, uh, but if you haven't been paying it, as far as everybody's concerned, it is a new tax. You know, if we're going to call ourselves Republicans, we need to look at the party platform and consider what's in that, as far as, you know, smaller, more efficient government, uh, you know, trying to be efficient with the tax revenue, looking for ways that we can... Uh, allow the people to keep as much money as possible and and i think that in order to do that and again this is one of my frustrations i was happy that uh, you know there were some tax cuts but then when you look at how the tax cuts were done we really just kind of shifted obligations around and Stop. That's the, uh, that is the new majority leader of the House now. That's State Representative Marcus Richmond. Uh, and we'll be back here in just a moment with more of uh, News You Need to Know. All right, so we've just been addressing <laughs> some, of, uh, some of the news of the day, but we are also doing it in flashbacks. You see there's this uh, uh, false uh, accusation. There's, there's something called, like, there are seven ways we've counted uh, to grow that, that the establishment uses to grow government. And we need to go back over those. Matter of fact, we'll, we'll do that um, sometime this week. But one of those ways is projection and deflection. So in order to deflect what you yourself are guilty of, you project the very thing you're guilty of on your political opponents. And this is what the Marble Palace establishment is doing. They, are, uh, they want you to assume that right now, right now as it stands at the Marble Palace, it's a utopia and that every legislator is allowed to legislate the way he or she chooses according to what their constituents want. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a lie. Um, there are people out there, and that one of the, one of the reasons Conduit News is here to give you the news is an attempt to liberate those legislators so they can think for themselves so they don't have to be beholden to a corrupt establishment and that ladies and gentlemen is uh, we're going to continue to expose this we're going to continue to give you the news now uh if you're just joining us good morning to you but we're just dissecting governor asa hutchinson's comments saying that uh you know uh, we've got to fight uh, he criticized conduit news last week called us a media machine because we're on different stations across the state criticized conduit for action because of the articles up there criticized us for saying that he's raised taxes uh because well he disagrees he doesn't think he has but we we've pointed out that he has raised taxes and the tire tax and things like that uh we've criticized him for a lot of things the spending increases and everything else so he criticized uh conduit news said that we're not actual news uh he was harder on conduit news than he and then he has ever been on the arkansas times than he's ever been on John Brummett or anything else. It's fascinating if you actually look at it. So um, 
we just wanted to do a little flashback. I de- I decided last year after the session and the disaster of a session where they tried to raise taxes and they increased spending, I sat down with as many legislators as I could, uh, and I got their impression of the session. And so we're kind of going through the highlights of that. And uh, now keep in mind, it's the governor who wants you to th- who who wants you to assume that he is not controlling these legislators at all. They don't feel controlled. It's somebody else. It's it's a it's an outside group that's trying to control them, and we've got to stop that. Just keep that in mind. That that is his allegation. As we listen to the rest of this impression of the session montage, take it, Joe. Against you, and I'll tell you something else, Paul. That I know. Gary Stubblefield. It, it, this is really troubling to me. It's, I've been there going on seven years, and. It, you know, sometimes I wonder why we even meet as legislators when, when you, ever, you have these, these special interest groups and these large corporations that we can work for weeks and months on bills and pieces of legislation trying to get in, them together to present. And all these groups have to do is come in and make one statement, and the whole thing is just turned upside down. Josh Waters is from Political Strategy. What's your impression of the session 2017? Well, um, if you would have asked me that with about two to three weeks to go in the session, I think it would have been a much different answer because the last two or three weeks, there's, you know, the internet sales tax and the gas tax hikes were defeated. And so going into those last few weeks, if those would have passed, uh, you know, this would have ended up being a session of over $300 million of tax increases. Over on tax, it would have. Until we get, until we get a group of uh, legislators who, who have a real backbone and are willing to stand up to some of these, I, I don't see things changing uh, in the near future. I had, we had some very positive things and then we had some disappointments. I was disappointed that as a Republican majority that we, you know, kept our expanded uh, uh, Medicare program. I, you know, I, it's just, you know, it'll end up bankrupting us. And, you know, I think it was Ronald Reagan that said that we measure the success of government by the amount of people that's not dependent on government. You know, I, I voted against the increases of taxes, uh, you know, like the internet sales. Uh, first of all, I don't think it's, I think that's an interstate commerce. I think that's uh, a federal issue and not a state issue because I can't imagine another state passing a law that I have to know about and that I have to be accountable to them for and I have no representation. We have massive Republican majorities down there and yet some of the key pillars of the Republican Party platform like not increasing taxes kind of seem to be ignored. Well, I, I, I agree with that. I think that's, that's key. You know, I'm, I, you know, I was sitting in county government for 20 years on the Garland County Quorum Court, and in those 20 years, the only tax increases we had were the ones that people themselves voted for. We were able to live within our means. It didn't mean that we didn't cut. It didn't mean that we didn't, you know, change some of the things that we we're providing, that we quit providing, but it's not incumbent on government to provide for everybody and, and to meet every whim that we want. Why do they need the money? Why do they need more money from us? Because it's, government loves to spend money. And what I think we all look at is there's always going to be more needs than there is money. At a certain point, you know, what, should we all just send our wallets and our checkbook to Little Rock and say, you just take what you think is fair and send it back when you're finished? Because there's always going to be a compelling reason. And believe me, I, I, I mean, I visit with people, I go to a lot of different agencies, they move around to my district and across this state, and there, there are needs out there. What I think we have to address is, you know, what of those needs need to be getting handled at the local level and what are need to be handled at the state level? Um, if you want less centralized government, then you've got to have, you know, a more of a focus on your local government and you've got to do more at the local level. President of the Family Council, Mr. Jerry Cox is on the line, you know, locker rooms and, you know, people are trying to go in this locker room or that locker room. So it is a problem, but that, you know, down at the uh, Marble Palace, they tend to say, hey, th- this isn't really a problem. We don't need to be we don't need to be doing this. So what all happened behind the scenes there? Well, uh, you know, it's all said and done. Some of this stems all the way back to uh, 2015 when we were able to pass a religious freedom bill that a number of LGBTQ individuals thought somehow would infringe on their rights. And so they all came to the Capitol and they protested and carried on. And 
I think uh, the governor and some other lawmakers decided, you know what, we don't want those people back out here, and the best way to keep them home is to not run any legislation that aggravates them. And so early on, the governor said, we don't need a bathroom privacy bill. Uh, It's just a common sense kind of bill, but the governor and others said, not necessary, not a problem, but are we going to wait until some little girl is uh, molested in a bathroom by some man uh, before we say it's a problem? I thought we were about preventing bad things from happening rather than waiting for it to happen. And see, once the uh, governor made his pronouncement that this is not a problem and we don't need this, then far too many lawmakers just kind of sat down and said, well, okay, then we won't do anything. Yeah. And that I find very disappointing. I- Talking with Senator Gary Stubblefield, people going into locker rooms they got no business going into. Do we really govern ourselves? Do we really, the we the people, have a say? Or is it Walmart or, like you said, the NCAA or the SEC? Well, it's, it's come down to money over safety as far as I'm concerned. We had, you know, the government kept saying we had no real issues, but that was, that was not exactly true because I was dealing with two or three issues in my own district, and I knew of several others in other districts who were having to deal with the same kind of thing. And uh, some of these schools felt powerless. They were gonna be sued, and they were told that they would lose the lawsuit. And uh, they really were looking for somebody to give them some advice, because we had nothing in statute that would protect them. And, uh, you know, we were just trying to bring it back to local control and let them, you know, decide what's best for them but we were even shut out from doing that and i think it's just come down to basically money is controlling everything and and, you know public safety is being put on the back burner and that's i don't think that's what the founders intended for this country to be like i really don't yeah the governor let's talk about the facts and when he came out and he had to cut the budget he was and said it's not a spending problem it's a revenue problem yeah i mean and like i said totally misleading and deceiving people as to say it's not my fault it's you people's fault that you didn't send me enough money um but then there were other bills that probably should have passed through committees and made it to the house floor but they were not heard or they were they were failed in committee so there were republicans that uh and that could have supported the bill, but I don't think they fully understood it. And some of them came to me privately and said, hey, look, I've got a lot of immigrant, maybe illegals in my district. And so I wanna be really careful not to come out and look like I'm you know, because opposing their presence here. Representative John Payton from District 64, was your impression of the session down there? The tire tax on used tires they're calling it a rim fee but the bottom line is it created a lot of new regulation trying to track those tires from cradle to grave that nobody really has a grasp on what it's going to cost and worse than that you know being in the automobile business all my life i see it as destroying the supply chain that moves those tires from the first owner to the second and third owner and you know it's all done in the name of recycling but the best way to recycle a tire is to put it on another automobile and wear it out if the regulations that we impose uh not just the tax but the regulation destroys that supply chain uh good tires are going to be going to the recycling centers instead of being worn out and so i think it compounds the problem they're trying to solve uh of course you know it's more money out of the people's pockets and who knows if it'll be enough to to cover the expense of, of tracking them from cradle to grave. We have State Representative Nell to speak. Thanks. State Representative Scott Baltz, what did the governor's office tell you? The governor's office uh, actually contacted Representative Joe Jett and said that if I didn't vote for Senate Bill 140, that the panic button would never be funded again. So you voted against the internet sales tax you did i did you did the did. opposite of what uh of what the governor wanted you to do I, I, yeah I, 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 in fact stop so th- this is we're going through our impression of the session we're really we're exposing actually who controls these legislators okay <laughs> and it's certainly not from any entity that is outside the marble palace establishment let's just say that to the least all right 
Now, that was Scott Baltz. He's a Democrat, and Scott Baltz would not vote for the Internet sales tax. And because he wouldn't vote for the Internet sales tax in committee, the governor killed funding for panic buttons at schools, just so you know. And his, his statement was they got to him through Joe Jett. Joe Jett contacted Scott Baltz, and, and, and Scott Baltz came on the program and talked about it. So, I mean, you tell me. You tell me who is speaking for the constituents. You know, we'd want, we only want people. The governor says we only want the representatives to represent the people in their district. Really, governor? Really? <laughs> All right, now back it up just a hair, and we're going uh, gonna to bring this home. With this experience, now keep in mind, it is the governor's assertion that right now it is a utopia down there and everybody is, it's just basically like Plato's Republic and everybody is freely uh, 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 representing the wills of their constituents and it, everything is working perfectly the way a government should work. That is his assertion and that it is conduit that is trying to change that and trying to control things. Listen to, again, back it up just a hair. This is Jerry Cox uh, from the Family Council when he was giving his impression of the session. Listen to this. 140, that the panic button would never be funded again. So you voted against the internet sales tax. You did. I did. You did the did. opposite of what, uh, of what the governor wanted you to do. Yeah. I, in fact, I've been going to the Capitol really since Bill Clinton was governor. And I think in many ways, this legislative body was one of the least independent thinking bodies that I've seen in a long time. Because many times, Paul, I would ask a lawmaker about sponsoring a bill, and they would the first thing they would say was, well, let me go check. Well, well check with who? Well, I need to check with House leadership, or I need to check with the governor's office. Or I need to check with this this group of people. And I'm like, can't you think for yourself? Why, why do you have to go get permission to file a bill? I thought you were, you know, a strong, independent person out here. But we saw that far too many times. Or a person would file a bill, and then the leadership would say, don't you run that bill. And they would just wilt in the face of that and not run the bill. I had people promise to run bills uh, that we wanted, and then, you know, they'd say, well, I've decided not to run it. Well, why? Well, leadership really doesn't want that. And that's just the end of it then. And so I find that very disappointing. The other thing that concerns me is I'm afraid that the, the people that the establishment at the Capitol, House leadership, the governor, Senate leadership, and others, I'm afraid the folks that they recruit to run for these vacant seats may be people that are even more so that way, even less independent, even less, you know, think on their own, stand on their own kind of people. And so if we end up with a legislative body where a few people say, hey, you have to do what I tell you to do because I got you elected, you know, I've got a pack over here that's funding you and you better sit down and be quiet and you'll do what I tell you to do, then we have lost that autonomy of the legislative branch and the really the, the, the separate the power then is being consolidated in the hands of just a few people who are able to order everybody else around. Now, Senator Terry Rice is with us from District 9, impression of the session 2017. In one word, it would be frustrated. Mm. Uh, and you know all sessions can get frustrating this one was counting uh, physical sessions which started the first term that i came in the house and served six years before moving to the senate but this one was to me the, the most frustrating that i've had and especially through committees i was on judiciary and, and senate state agencies i kept thinking Man, our roads are falling apart. We, we need to come up with a long-term highway plan. We need to be shrinking government. We're two, almost two and a half years into a new administration that uh, has people voted to, to less government. Uh, and it, I realize it's a process, it takes time, uh, but we need to be doing that. And there's so many things that, that I wanted to see addressed, uh, cutting back on this
uh, bloated, inflated Medicaid spending. Uh, uh, colleague told me uh, that it was $3.2 billion just a few short years ago, and now it's $7.2 billion. Mm-hmm. Here in Arkansas. State Representative Greg Letting, he's a Democrat right. from Fayetteville. What was no, your... It's actually funny, the Democrat from Fayetteville, Greg Letting, actually goes on to say he had one of his most productive sessions. Um, but you get the point, don't you, folks? Hey, actually, skip skip a little ahead there. Can you skip to, uh, let's see, uh, John Payton? Yeah, let's get the very end here, okay? Real quick, I want, I want you to get the very end before we have to go to break. Here's what State Representative John Payton said at the end of our... Conservatives response. still on the defense instead of being on the offense and, you know, trying to fight the fuel tax and the Internet tax, so... Uh, I guess my the way I'd sum it up was it's a missed opportunity. Huh, a missed opportunity. We were playing defense on things you think we wouldn't be playing defense on. Exactly. I mean, instead of proactively reducing government impact on our lives, you know, I found myself fighting new and increased taxes and fees, new and increased regulation. That's Liberty t- is still in jeopardy. Liberty is still in jeopardy that's how it ends now okay so uh again you guys be the judge i guess the truth is out there if if you want it now we're we are trying to be that medium of truth we're trying to be that medium of actually an open debate of ideas you know a lot of people want to say if you're for a limited government or for shrinking spending or for decreasing dependency on government, all that, that somehow you're narrow minded and you want to shut government down. That's actually them projecting it is with the establishment and with ASA. It is actually, in my opinion, no, there can be no disagreement. It is our way or the highway. It, it, it's, it's almost like, uh, I mean, um, it, it's really the complete opposite. I want to, for example, for example, and I'll give you a perfect example. When the county committees were getting pressure from the governor's office to not allow Jan Morgan to speak, okay, that was that was uh, offensive to me and offensive to a lot of Arkansans because the Republican Party is supposed to be the party of ideas and open debate and freedom of speech, and not try to silence somebody just because you might disagree with them. So I'm I'm perfectly willing. Uh, and I think true conservatives are perfectly willing to have the debate and just let the chips fall where they may, right? But uh, now we have people who are actively trying to say in a very hypocritical manner that apparently right now the special interests in Little Rock and the Marble Palace don't exist and that uh, everything is a utopia. It's perfect. It's working great. But it's all of a sudden conduit news is the problem because the ASA criticized us last week. It's now conduit news. This is the problem because they're trying to uh, change things. They're trying to control legislators. He said through a media arm, they're trying to control legislators. Now you just listen to the, uh, the impression of the session. I was on the entire. I was on the entire time covering this. We were covering bills. We were critical of the bills that grew government. We praised the bills that didn't, and yet government grew. So you tell me who's more influential, Governor Asa Hutchinson, or uh, a news program that's on two hours a day? By the way, just a two-hour program. Something is interesting, and I'm telling you to kind of recap this. Why did we get attacked last week? I think it's because the corruption in Arkansas government is now being prosecuted. People are admitting they took the bribes. People are admitting or they're caught on tape trying to kill other people in other states. Um, And I think because we have been one of the voices, one of the few voices saying how corrupt we are. And I think that that I'm just telling you, I think what Asa was doing last week was an attempt to delegitimize what is truthful, accurate representation of the environment and the Marble Palace and Little Rock and how corrupt it really is. Uh, at least that's my analysis for the time being. I reserve the right to change that if facts uh, change or if the uh, you know new information arises. Just like a good legislator, right? We got to take a break. Back in a minute. Buy, sell, and trade at Triple R Pawn in Ash Flat. Firearms, computers, sporting goods, musical instruments, tools, jewelry, and everything else you can think of. It's all at Triple R Pawn at the light in Ash Flat. Gun enthusiasts, log on now to triplerpawn.com and browse their amazing inventory. 
That's triple R pawn.com. You can also call them at 870-994-PAWN. That's 870-994-7296. Let the great team at Triple R Pawn help you find what you're looking for. That's Triple R Pawn at the light in Ash Flat, triple R pawn.com, or call 870-994-PAWN. If you're like me, you believe that small business is the heart of Arkansas's economic engine, and it should be viewed that way by the politicians in Little Rock. Conduit for Commerce also believes, like you and I believe, policies that achieve less regulation and lower taxation help small business in Arkansas thrive. Other policies like small, constitutionally consistent government and reducing citizen dependency on government keeps it from growing and expanding its influence on our daily lives. Conduit for Commerce works every day to educate the general public and legislators on these important priorities in the name of Arkansas small business. By the way, contributions to Conduit for Commerce are tax deductible. Log on now to conduitforcommerce.org and click on Contact Us on the right side of the page. That's conduitforcommerce.org. Go there now and learn the facts on protecting small business in Arkansas. Determined to drain the swamp in Little Rock, it's Conduit News Radio with Paul Harrell. Uh, yeah, this might have been, uh, honestly, this might have been one of the best hours we've ever done when it just comes to sheer truth and information and uh letting see because it's not just me that is saying these things it's not just the great articles over at conduitforaction.org that are writing about these things these are legislators in their own words telling you about the environment down at the marble palace and it can it it directly conflicts with what the governor said last week about uh you know outside groups i mean the 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 <laughs> I mean, how many outside groups are there? Because most most of the groups are inside groups. And that's really the difference is it's like if you're if you're trying to change the way business is done by I mean, let's be honest, by getting business out of it, you know, politics and business shouldn't be together, but that's the way they like it. And this is an incredible amount of money. And you just gotta think who is making money and getting paid to do certain things versus who is giving money to causes and not getting anything in return, right? There are very few involved in politics. Most people are like, you know, hey, I want medical marijuana. I'm going to pay to get it on the ballot so I can make a lot of money off of it. That's the only reason most people are motivated to do anything in government. Very few just want more liberty, more freedom, more voluntary cooperation for all Arkansans. And that's what I want. Back in a minute. The missed the first hour of the program. I want to urge you to go back and listen to it. If you're watching on Facebook Live right now, wait another hour until this uh, the, the full video is concluded and you can go back. You can get it right now at the uh, podcast, uh, iTunes, or SoundCloud audio only. Um, but just it, it, what did we title it, Joe? What was it? Uh, the truth about control in Little Rock. You want to know the truth about who controls who? Uh, we, not in my words, but in legislators' own words, talked about this and so you definitely need to go back and listen to it i think it was one of the best hours that we've ever done hey 